Welcome to uh, our sixth online edition of uh, Startup and Angel, uh, or um, event series uh, celebrating startup founders and um, investors uh, in Asia Pacific and now kind of a bit more globally. Um, today, I'm very, very excited um, to uh, have this amazing lineup uh, of both early stage uh, startup founders and investors uh, talking to us, you know, about how they are pivoting their business, what they're currently doing uh, in the in the current economic climate. Um, so I'll be your MC today. Uh, my name is Leo Dones. I'm the founder of uh, Australians, uh, the company uh, behind uh, Startup and Angels, and we our mission is really to help. Um, entrepreneurs, uh, professionals to, uh, to thrive. Uh, we've been assisting uh, a number of uh, international and Australian startup with their uh, expansion. And we recently um, actually hired uh, a number of amazing uh, professionals for um, a net tech company called Zuko uh, and uh, an international um, scale up coming to Australia called Aircore. Uh, we just closed uh, as of yesterday a new round of 65 uh, million uh, US dollar uh, for their Series C. So watch this space with uh, Aircore uh, growing um, exponentially. So uh, today I would like also to, to thank uh, our, a couple of uh, sponsors, OVH Cloud, um, that is that has been assisting us for you no know, over just a, a year now. We start up an angel. Uh, and we welcome Pledge 1%, uh, basically uh, an amazing program um, encouraging uh, startup founders to uh, contribute 1% of uh, the sales equity um, for uh, social projects. Uh, so we'll, we'll be posting more information about them and how you can uh, join the movement. Uh, so yeah, maybe briefly about Startup and Angel. So, we actually uh, love this theme of pivoting because we've really been in a similar boat. You know, before uh, the COVID, we actually ran 42 um, physical events uh, across over 12 countries um, in Asia Pacific, mainly as well as uh, Africa. And uh, over the last four years, and you know, with obviously the ban uh, of any physical events and gathering. Um, you know, of uh, humans, uh, we actually pivoted and uh, not only have, are organizing these events uh, online, uh, but as well um, actually launched an uh, online community. Uh, so with a dedicated platform um, where you can uh, actually find other uh, startup founders, uh, find mentors, uh, as well as a number of online resources. Uh, you know, that's all contribution uh, in this crisis. It's uh, absolutely free uh, and we'll have a, a, a forever free um, model for, uh, for members. Uh, so thanks to uh, over 260 members who joined over the last five, six weeks. Um, and uh, a big thanks as well in particular to, uh, to Robert, uh, you know, who kind of um, is, um, is pretty active in the, in the community. And we'll dedicate some uh, some time after that um, that session uh, in a private uh, online networking uh, from 7 p.m. Australia time. Um, so thanks thanks uh, thanks a lot, Robert. Um, so as mentioned, if you're not part of our online community, uh, uh, we will um, put the link um, as part of the of the chat, and you're very welcome to uh, to join. It's a pretty quick process to sign up. Okay, so now without further ado, uh, I'll welcome uh, Angela. Hey, Angela, uh, the founder and CEO of uh, Akatons International. Um, welcome, Angela. Cool. So, hi, everyone. I'm Angela, and I first started doing hackathons after I finished university, and I found it really hard to find a job. So I was actually doing a bit of contract work at Cancer Council in New South Wales, and I saw a massive need for charities to 
fundraise money, not only to support people who had cancer, but also their supporting family. So I was kind of like, oh my goodness, wouldn't it be cool to like develop an app or build something around that? So I approached one of my friends and she told me, Angela, why don't you go to a hackathon? You know, you can meet some friends, learn a little bit about tech and IT and what apps really are. And I was like, sure, why not? Um, I hadn't studied entrepreneurship. I had not studied design thinking. I don't think design thinking or entrepreneurship was, existed um, when I went to uni. And so um, didn't even come from an IT or engineering background for that matter. And so I kind of went in and I was mind blown. I like in my team, I had someone who was 11 years old learning to code his first apps. And that was really exciting to help him out. And um, we also had another um, girl, Rachel, and she also finished, um, just finished university and her dad was a software engineer. So he was a great mentor for us. And I met so many startup founders, um, mentors, kind of similar in your situation, kind of going, oh my goodness, like what is this startup ecosystem? What is this innovation word actually mean? And so that got me me intrigued into understanding and being involved with a lot of other hackathons. So subsequently after that, for about like three years, I participated in around 30 to 40 hackathons, you could say. So every couple of weeks I was upskilling myself and that, that three year session was pretty much my second university degree. I didn't get a piece of paper or a certificate, but it was all through experiential learning. So one day at the pub, us hackathon goers, we were like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to create a hackathon community to spread the hackathon bug, find real problems to solve, um, actually tell our friends and family what we actually do and not like, we're not scary cats, we're not massive like security nuts and coders and that kind of thing. But we really wanted to bring that culture to everyone in the business and so um, around Australia. And so honestly, I just opened my laptop and that's how we created Hackathons Australia around six years ago now. And so um, if we go to our next slide, um, a lot of people in our Facebook group started to comment and um, say, hey, you know, this is Hackathons happening in Canada, this other hackathon happening in India, in Ireland, in Palestine. And I kind of said to myself, like, why are these people approaching us? And why as organizers, do we have to individually go out to every single hackathon community in all the countries all around the world advertising what we do? So then what did we do? Open our laptop again and created Hackathons International. So we saw this opportunity to go global and also support our local people in that space. We saw that online was a great way to pivot and birth our second startup, which was start, um, Hackathons International. So Hackathons Australia and Hackathons International, their sister companies, not the same thing. Um, and then when we kind of formalized and got together as a group and as a team, we we knew that, you know, how everyone normally travels an hour to work and then an hour back from work, and that's two hours of time. So we saw this as a new opportunity to look into creative time. So we've got, you know, full-time work, you've got creative time, and then you've got hobbies. And this also, you know, if you know about the brain and the neuroscience behind that, it's really interesting to understand the prefrontal cortex. And so for us, how we function as a group and as a, you know, with anyone who goes to hackathons, it's not really, a lot of the time, it's not what we do on our day-to-day -day job. It's something that we do for fun. And so we have this work, not work policy where um, we use our creative time to exercise that um, creative muscle, that growth muscle in our brain. And we see that a lot of people, including I'm sure all of you guys have got new hobbies, new interests, everyone's baking, everyone's landscaping, everyone's doing gardening. And so it's a really great way for us to say, okay, why don't we use hackathons as a way to flex that um, creative time and that creative muscle. And then the third thing that we saw impact COVID-19 was this need and redefinition of need versus want. So we see a lot of that happening, especially in the, um, in the startup world where you say, hey, let's solve a need and not a want. In the smart energy world, which is where I currently work in, we have critical loads, so critical infrastructures. If things go down, what is the basic thing that you need to upload so, um, or to keep running? So we see this emergence of also critical infrastructure that we need to solve problems for. 
And so if we go to the next slide very quickly, um, a lot of you know hackathons are normally physical events. So a lot of energy in the environment is vibrant and we get a lot of people together networking. But now we see online hackathons needing a lot of strong leadership, human community management, as a matter of fact, um, a lot of content that is structured and also utilizes it utilization of tools to its full extent. Um, if we go to our next slide. Um, so ultimately our mission is to empower everyone, whether it be organizers, first timers, um, just normal, you know, just normal day-to-day -day people to be change makers. And we do that through, you know, for example, if you don't know how to run a hackathon, we provide educational resources. And you know how when people go to um, register for a hackathon or register for events, do they actually turn up? Um, we want to build confidence for beginners to understand what actually happens at a hackathon. So we have a hacker toolkit, which is also an e-learning module. So for those who don't know what a hackathon is in our next slide, I've just defined it really quickly because I think, yep. Um, and so we see a hackathon as a creative intensive process where a diverse group of people to come together to solve meaningful problems. And ultimately we're not creating strategy sessions. We're not doing ideation sessions. We're not just doing um, forums, but we're creating a tangible product to that minimum awesome product to demonstrate to a paying customer. So getting from idea and putting that into action is what we do best. And that's it for me. Thanks for that, uh, uh, Angela. So what's um, so you so you mentioned uh, basically you uh, know moving uh, online. Um, do you want to share a little bit about the the journey you've been in, or you know some of the challenge and opportunity you found out by by moving online? Yep, so going online initially, even with, if I compare building up Hackathons Australia to Hackathons International, like it took maybe six months to get 200 people on our community because it was all through word of mouth. Also at that time, there weren't as many hackathons happening, probably once every like two weeks, whereas now every day, like, in one month, you could have at least 30 hackathons that are running at the same time. So there's a lot of opportunity for wider reach. Not only are we restricted to, you know, 100 people in a room, but we can have thousands of people. There was an EU virus hackathon. I think there were like hundreds of thousands of people that registered to that. So having that global presence has been a really great opportunity for us. Even like we've been involved in hackathons in Morocco, in Palestine, in India, in Ireland, in um, Canada. So just having that presence all around the world has been really great in terms of building our brand awareness. And now for us, we just recently finished our minimum awesome product, um, which is all those e-learning modules. So we've just got a couple on there. And like for us, we have we see that as core business. And then, you know, that's Horizon 1, and then you've got Horizon 2 and Horizon 3. So just working on the second and third horizons now that we are like mobilized. So mobilizing as a team has been really efficient for us. Beautiful. And we... Uh, we ju we just got a a, a live question uh, uh, in terms of what is there a secret recipe for a, a great online event or hackathon? Uh, you know, obviously we we we're running a, a live event here. Uh, from your experience, what's uh, what's key? Yeah. So for me, I talk about the. Uh the piss. <laughs> I don't want to take the piss out of this, but um, um, so P-I-S-S, -S, what does that stand for? Purpose. So what is your purpose? Intent. What is the intent of the event itself? Who are the sponsors? So who's running the show and what are they wanting to get out of it? And then also the skills that not only are you going to offer, but you're going to learn from the hackathon or from the event as well. So if you nail those four, the piss framework, the purpose, the intent, the understanding the sponsor and also the skill sets that you want to offer and learn that would be key beautiful so thank you uh thank you so much angela we just on the in the in the allocated time um and uh you know hopefully uh we'll uh we'll, we'll have some more uh, some more question insight for you uh, at the end so thank you thank you so much um also, I'll take the opportunity to maybe uh, share the results of um, 
uh, of, of our first poll. Uh, basically, it's good to see that you know, like a minority, minority of you have seen the business go in sleep mode with the COVID-19, um, where, uh, you know, minority as well are pivoting uh, their business model, uh, and uh, a majority are actually finding new opportunities. Um, I think that's a poll we've been running uh, over our last events. It's great to see that, you know, uh, entrepreneurs actually keep a pretty optimistic mindset uh, in this difficult time, um, and uh, yeah, are kind of real problem solver. So uh, great, uh, great to see the the, the spirit here. Uh, so I'll quickly uh, give a chance to Nathan, uh, maybe to unmute. Hey, Nathan. Uh, hello there. Hey. Well, welcome, Nathan, the co-founder of. Uh, Founder, we don't have the name yet. Yeah, do we a quick update? <laughs> yes, um, oh, perfect. Right. Well, um, yeah, well, um, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Leo, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, to give you a little bit of backgrounds in terms of uh, Quicka Pay, so Quicka Pay is an online payments platform for small businesses. Um, we've been around since uh, July of 2019. Um, we originally uh, founded Quicka Pay during the um, first Antler cohort here in Sydney. Um, and uh, basically have been working on it full time ever since then. Um, and basically we landed on the idea of Quicka Pay, um, which had to do around cash flow and just um, unpaid invoices for small businesses. And when you started to look at the reasons of why people don't pay invoices on time, it's usually drive between, um, for three core reasons. Um, the first reason is I'm super busy, so you have to remind me. And what we found um, during our early stages was that invoices go, um, emails go to black box, but everyone responds to a text message. Um, the second thing was, the second most common reason was, well, I don't have enough money right now. Can I pay you through installments? And so we said, well, that's pretty easy we can do. Let's let's just, you know, embed an installment engine um, in there so you can pay through your credit cards, you can pay through installments, and it goes from text right to your phone. Um, so that was the, the initial concept. And we're really looking at, you know, trying to get these businesses paid faster, create a better, better customer experience. And so we um, launched Quicka Pay. We built MVP pretty quickly, had a couple users um, on the platform within the first month, and then basically started to grow from there. Um, however, as we were just getting ready to really um, hit our stride, if you want to go to the, the next slide there, Leo. Um, we, we basically were really starting to hit our stride and we were doubling down on invoices. Um, we were just getting ready to embed um, our intelligent email SMS follow-up so it automate the whole process um, and you can manage all your paying customers. And one of the things that um, happened, unfortunately, was the, the coronavirus um, and basically business just ceased to exist as is. So my co-founder and I really took a step back and said, okay, we don't want to spend any money on digital acquisitions right now. We know that people still are going to raise invoices, still going to pay invoices. We know that coming out of coronavirus, no one's going to have money to pay for anything. Um, and that, that's the unfortunate reality of the situation that we're all in. So we started um, looking at other ways that we could ultimately acquire users through our installment engine, which is where we make most of our margin, um, and do it from a, a freemium perspective. Um, so um, we, we were focusing on the invoicing side of things, still acquiring users. We started to turn marketing off. And um, within like a couple of days, we had people reaching out to us and saying, can we use your guys, um, your, your API to, for the payments engine. Um, if you wanna flow to the next slide there. And basically what we ended up doing is we ended up setting up an open API um, where businesses um, can offer customers the ability to pay for goods, services, um, they're typically between $1,000 to about $10,000 um, through our checkout product. So what this did is it allowed us to basically acquire users at scale. Um, we were a little intimidated at first because we we're going up against like, up, going up against the likes of uh, PayPal and Stripe and a lot of incumbents that are bedded in there. But what we found is that a bundled solution of both pay, um, credit card um, and installments as a single solution actually creates a lot of value for the businesses that are looking to offer this, um, as well as customers that are looking for ways to pay um, because either they don't have a credit card um, or they're a small business and accessing credit as a small business is incredibly difficult. 
Um, so we ended up doubling down on that. Um, and within um, you know a month and a half of work, we managed to get an API stand up. We're pushing our first customers live and we've got about 10 more in the pipeline um, that we'll be looking to go live with here. And that puts us at about a million ARR, which is pretty mind boggling for you know doing less than two months of beauty work and all these things started coming together. Um, and um, yeah, we've, um, it was a really big learning lesson because you go in with a mindset, you think that this is what we're going to do. We're going to focus on this one problem, but ultimately your customers come to you and they tell you what the problems are. You just have to be prepared to solve them in a way that gets them excited and their customers excited. And that's really what we've done with quick pay. And um, you know, one of our, one of our core values is move fast, think big. Um, but sometimes that doesn't necessarily work out. Sometimes you you have to actually take that step back and really look at your surrounding situations and look at opportunities in the rough. Um, and um, we've really been able to leverage that. So we're um, we're very excited for the direction that we're headed. And um, you know, if you if you think you're stuck on a single problem, take a step back because oftentimes the problem that you think you're solving isn't the problem you should be solving. You should be listening to the customer's problem and focusing on that. And right now, there's a lot of problems facing small businesses. And if you just look in the right areas, there's tons of opportunity to be had. You just got to know where to look. Um, so that's kind of our, um, our background on QuickPay in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer questions, um, elaborate further if you guys want. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Nathan. And then, sorry, I had some uh, some issues, uh, you know, kind of sharing the uh, the, the screen and everything. Um, but uh, so you you I mean you covered a lot of uh, a lot of ground, obviously on your uh, on your journey. Um, so, I mean, is there uh, any kind of recurring theme you see at the moment with, uh, you know, your, uh, uh, your obviously, uh, uh, SMB's, uh, SMB's uh, client, um, you know, in the, in the, in the current uh, climate? Yeah, I think the, the big eye opener for us was looking at, um, you know, a lot of, I think it's like 30% of businesses still only accept cash. And the reality is, is that, you know, 40% of businesses are going to go in there because they just don't have enough cash to get through, which means cash is gone. Um, there was a massive black market economy. A lot of businesses don't want to pay GST. They don't want to pay tax. So they just, you know, cash, 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 cash. No one has cash anymore. Cash is gone. Um, you know, there, there are, there's still some floating around, but not at the extent at which it was, which creates a big opportunity because now businesses that were really resident to go online, accept online payments. Now they have no choice, but to accept online payments or they're not going to have a business in six months. And so it's kind of looking for that opportunity. And that's really what we've landed on. And that's where we're doubling down on and putting all of our energy and efforts into at the moment. Yeah. You know, you, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely right uh, around kind of uh the impact of the of the crisis uh, you know pushing the kind of cashless um economy and like uh, and digital money um any um so basically but did you did you see any uh because i mean there obviously been a lot of support as well uh you know kind of from the from the government uh you know especially uh for uh smes uh you know that been the job keeper put in place you know I, I mean from your perspective are there some business uh who didn't benefit at all um i think the ones that probably got hit the hardest to be honest are probably the the freelancers just the, the sole traders they're turning under over less than seventy five thousand dollars a year and there's a lot of them in australia sadly um and they're the ones that are probably being overlooked the most um we are trying to um you know support as many small businesses as we can where we can help them, you know, pay bills through installments and do other creative ways to support the the, the community that's been backing us since day one. So um, it's uh, it's one of those things where you know we don't know where things are going to land. It's still too soon to say. But hopefully everything moves in the right direction. Either way, we're still going to continue to build tools that are aligned towards our company mission, which is solving cash flow for small businesses, um, and we'll always stay true to that core mission. Great. Anyone want to uh, add, add anything or any, any question for Nathan? Uh, I'll just, I might just say, Leo, that I think, um, you know, Nathan's approach in pivoting to what the customer really needs is like the essence of a business. You know, you can't build a business without a customer. What do the customers in the market really want? And when you define that really well and you sort of nail it, you can grow a really great business. So, 
Well done, Nathan, with your growth so far. That's really yeah. exciting. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. So without further ado, we'll uh, maybe get you uh, the chance to introduce yourself, uh, uh, Michelle, and I'll uh, put your slide up. Let's please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm Michelle Deek, a managing partner of Australian venture capital firm, One Ventures. We um, cover both technology and healthcare. Uh, so if you can get to the next slide, Leo, that would be great. Um, you know, I think actually, if I look at myself and my life, I'm probably the the biggest artist in the pivot. Um, I think I've pivoted through my whole life. <laughs> I started life as a, you know, scientist basically, and then, um, you know, moved out of there and set up, you know, I set up an education company when I was at university. I set up, a, uh, then moved into establishing technology companies. Um, a bit like Angela, you know, found a new focus in life and moved in that direction. And, um, and I love the way Angela sort of, took her business and moved it online and thought bigger actually about it because sometimes we sometimes think a bit small and sometimes the world is a much bigger place if we just think about that opportunity there so we back technology and healthcare we have 400 million under management 27 investee companies our firm was founded by business founders so we actually understand the journey that all you guys are going on and this is why i love participating in these types of events because you know, we've all walked the road before and, you know, we have some empathy for what that road's like and it's not all easy. Um, we now have about 21 people in our team and we're backed by, you know, a lot of high net worths and family offices and also the Australian government. We manage over 100 million for the Australian government. So uh, if you can just flip to the next slide, Leo, that'd be great. Um, we have some main streams of business. We have our early stage venture. Our current fund there is fully deployed. We have venture credit as a product, which is where we pay, provide loans to high growth um, businesses with about more than 5 million in revenue. And that's less dilutive for founders than taking equity. So it's an option for your company as it's sort of in the scale up mode. Um, we do clinical healthcare as well. So, you know, we have one of our companies right now targeting um, COVID-19. We have a vaccine nanopatch company as well that um, could replace the need for needles for vaccination and enable much more effective um, and faster vaccinations. So we, we're looking for really transformative businesses and founders that, you know, have big ideas to change the world in what they're doing. Um, so I loved Angela's story for that reason. Um, and then we have a growth pillar, which is really for our scale-ups. So for the scale-ups out there, we've got a growth fund, which is about to bring our fund five to market in that area. And that's an opportunity for you guys um, to have us as investors. And we're pretty hands-on um, to support your business. Do you want to go to the next slide, Leo, please? Um, just, you know, to give you some ideas, I mentioned the vaccine nanopatch, you know, we've got a peanut allergy company, we've got an intelligent tutoring company and personalised e-learning. Um, these are the types of businesses. We've got an HR business in the cloud that's, um, again, supporting all the SMEs out there with managing their employees, remote working in the cloud and managing their payroll and also their job keeper as well. So they pivoted to actually enable people to do JobKeeper. If we go to the next slide. Thanks, Leo. So I mentioned um, myself and what I've done over the years. And when I had my first real tech startup, I was one of Australia's first FinTech companies. And this was back in the dot-com one days. And we started with online vouchers. We thought that would be a really good idea. You know, everyone thought it was gonna be the big e-commerce Christmas. Uh, we raised money, we spent money on bus sides and marketing. Um, and one thing I learned is, you know, you never ask your advertising company to write your business plan because they have plenty of ways to spend money and it doesn't necessarily drive revenue in your company. So we spent money on things like bus, bus sides. And I think it was about November 1999 and I realised that it wasn't going to be the big e-commerce Christmas that everyone said it was going to be because we should have been achieving certain revenue and it wasn't happening. And so what I did was I actually pulled all our marketing budget really quickly. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made because we needed that capital runway because we went into a tech crash. 
And then we started looking around and we'd signed, you know, Dimix and all the big retailers, we'd signed them to online vouchers. So they were all excited about electronic vouchers and online vouchers because vouchers had always been a really big pain point in their business. But actually when the tech crash happened, and we started thinking about how were we going to make money because we needed paying customers. We couldn't have a business that, you know, only captured 0.1% of the market. You know, we needed a business that could capture 100% of the market. So we started listening to our customers. And what our customers really needed was an in-store electronic tracking solution for vouchers. So one customer had lost $500,000 worth of vouchers just stolen out of their office on bits of paper that kept walking back in store. So there was this massive pain point that we just hadn't explored. So we pivoted the business, we integrated through FPOS, um, we started working with all the major banks and in the end we owned the Australian electronic voucher and gift card market. And we started expanding overseas and then we were acquired by a UK publicly listed company. Um, in this space. So certainly that was a really big pivot and it was driven by an economic downturn where we actually stopped like Nathan and we listened to the customer what was the really big problems and what were the pain points and then that really drove our business and accelerated our business. So if you go to the next slide, Leo. So I just thought I'd talk about like some tips from me about crisis management. You really have to understand and watch, watch your cash flow uh, for the bit that you have and just focus on your core business and listen to the customers because they can pay up front. So, you know, they might even pay before you deliver the service to them and that can help you with your business. You know, a bit of bartering can help too. You know, help somebody else and maybe they'll help you. And one of the other things I did when I was trying to work out how to manage cash through the tech crash was I offered one of our first customers exclusivity uh, because they seemed to be focused on that in exchange for, a, I think we actually doubled the value of the contract. So it actually paid my monthly wages bill in the doubling of that contract. And it allowed me to carry my company forward for six months while the contract existed. So it was a really important step. But some of the other things you can do if you're a bit further down the track is things like invoice discounting or people offer loans against your R&D. Um, you can retain talent with equity and try and offset that against, you know, what you might need to pay them. It's a good opportunity to cut underperforming staff. And I certainly did that in my business, whereas I've been prepared to carry them when the time was good and I had plenty of money in the bank. And then, you know, have the capital raising plan A, B, C, and maybe D. And I certainly, when the tech crash happened, I was about to get money from Alliance and Leicester Bank in the UK. We'd been to final due diligence. Deloitte had been out doing two weeks work. And it all fell through at the last minute, except that I had a plan B. And I'd been talking to some local investors, just some high net worths, and they came to the table and I managed to close capital wasn't as good a valuation, but I still managed to get my business there. Key suppliers can also create an opportunity for you um, to get an investor that isn't the same as taking on a strategic acquirer um, for your business. They might just want to support your business and get a bit of equity in your business. Um, a bit of consulting to help pay the bills helps. And look out for all the grants and incentives. And I know New South Wales government, I was with the minister yesterday, he's looking to put like quite a lot more money into the tech sector. So, so watch this space because all the governments are about to get active. Um, and that's sort of it from me. And happy to sort of answer any questions or discuss more with Angela and Nathan and Robert after Robert's presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Michel. Uh, yeah, definitely the great case study from your own experience with the gift voucher uh, pivot. Uh, quite, um, quite amazing uh, story. So very well done. Um, yeah, if everyone uh, you know wants to put some uh, some questions, uh, you know, we'll have we'll have time to uh, uh, to discuss. Um, more in details uh, after um, 
Robert's presentation. Uh, and as well, you know, uh, a big thanks to you, uh, Michelle, for putting, uh, you know, all these tips together. Um, I think you may have uh, a blog post uh, that detailed maybe uh, some of them, uh, and maybe we'll be, uh, be able to, uh, to post the link um, to, this, yeah. uh, to this blog post in the chat. Thank you so much. So let's get to, uh, to Robert now. Welcome, Robert. Hi, Leo. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here, and I've been really inspired by all those stories. Certainly, uh, Michelle, you've been there and you've done it all. You're going full circle, haven't you? Right through the... You certainly, when, when, when you're talking, you can definitely... Uh, people should be listening. Like you've been there and done it from the, from the coal face, as they say, so to speak. Um, but equally, um, congratulations to both um, Angela and Nathan as well, who've um, really taken the bull by the horn, so to speak, and used uh, this crisis... Um, as an opportunity um, and not seeing it as uh, simply, you know, the catastrophe and disaster that it's easily, so easily to do. Um, there's been a lot of damage done out there economically and to people's personal lives as well. And it's real, and with the new cycle and everything we see, it's really hard to stay motivated and positive with the opportunities that are presented out there. Um, but as Michelle's pointed out, you know, there's, 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 always, there's always hope and, um, and, and opportunity to be grasped. You've just got to know how to uh, lean into it and take it by the hand, take it by both hands and run with it as well. And be street smart as well as uh, textbook smart in this particular particular approach. Um, so, um, so, so a little bit about, about me is um, I'm the founder and um, I'm the chief investment officer and director of a, a firm called Cradle Ventures. Um, so we're a, um, uh, if you just go to the next slide there, thanks, Leo. Um, we're a, a private investment company, um, but also a corporate trustee. Um, so I've been in the game of uh, being an angel investor for close to about seven years now. Um, a bit like Michelle, I started out as um, an entrepreneur, founded a couple of businesses, um, was able to exit those in different capacities. Um, but uh, I really talk about having lived that journey and being into the trenches with everybody else. So I know that uh, I know those pain points that a lot of founders are going through, those experiences and those dark moments that you have, and also those really enlightening moments that you have there as well. Um, so uh, our focus is, um, is technology, um, product-led, highly scalable, um, with a global, with global relevance. Um, Raising TAMs, total total addressable markets, as they refer to. We're um we're pre-seed through to Series A, and so we're we're early in the capital stack, as they say, foundation base. Um, as Michelle pointed out, they're a bit later, even in their in the part of their seed business, they're really Series A on. Um, and I'll make a connection there soon in terms of the, the nexus and the connection that's really pivotal to the ecosystem between. Um, parties uh, like Angels and myself and in the later VCs and, and how we come together to help uh, support and stimulate the, the, the system. Um, we're agnostic focused. Um, diversity supports diversification um, is really the ethos, ethos there. Um, you're never going to really pick, picking winners is a very incredibly difficult and challenging task. You are looking for the outperformer. Um, this is a sector where you play for home runs, as they say. Um, but you don't know if that batter is actually going to step up to the plate and strike out or actually hit it out of the park. Uh, so you build yourself a good foundation of good players um, and you let them get on with doing what they do best. Um, we invest through a number of different instruments, including uh, safe, simple agreements for future equity, um, convertible notes uh, and preference shares. Uh, so we're pretty open to a conversation in terms of you know, the best approach to support the needs of both uh, the founder and the investor. Uh, investment target time frame four to seven years for partial uh, or full, ex full exits. Um, so really look to that opportunity, understand what the founders' plans are in achieving that exit, um, how they're going to go through a series of um, consecutive capital raises, and where those where those opportunities to get a bit of liquidity may occur. Um, as the trade sales and market acquisitions are a preferred approach to exits. Not so inspired by ambitions to, to uh, IPO. Uh, worked in the capital markets long enough know, now to know how difficult it is to run an IPO process, um, challenging its thought with danger and it's pretty expensive as well. Um, 
So uh, yeah, it often there's a better way to, to exit. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously if, you're, if you're going to be super global and end up in the ranks of the Atlassians of the world, yeah, it's definitely worth considering. Uh, but if you're going to be by the traditional mill, you're probably looking to know who your potential acquirer is from the day you start your business. Um, Looking, we look to invest between two to three uh, new investments a year, but we also do follow on as well, um, which is pretty key to the process, but we'll follow on up until series A, um, and obviously depending on performance there as well. Um, if you just go to the next slide, thanks Leo. Um, our role um, is really as an enabler, um, so that's the startups can validate the product market fit, commence their growth, trajectory um, and so we can hand them off to highly resourced VC firms and it's really for them to help them accelerate into that greatness. Um, so um, one venture has been a great example there. Um, we back high conviction ventures through seed rounds uh, of MVP, minimal gold product and proof of concept um, to enable them to position for those checks that will give them wings as we say into that next stage of, of growth. Um, our value is really around being a resource enabler and a risk mitigator. Um, so the experience that they've had there, um, having done much of what um, founders aspire to do, um, we've been there and we've actually um, been through all the challenges um, and we know where potholes can exist and often where are bumps in the road, uh, where that hairpin's coming up and if you're going a little bit too fast, you don't want to lose control. Um, so just being able to anticipate uh, and prepare for that as well. Um, uh, Five-year performance, we're tracking in about um, an IR of about 32%. Um, and so far, the book's solid um, out of the eight that we're, uh, that we're running with, so we haven't had any fall over yet, which is, which is, which is great. Um, so looking forward to those ventures eventually coming out the other end. Um, so just moving in terms of uh, the next, next slide, thanks, Leo, which is um, getting to the point of the pivot. But when we're looking at ventures, we're really looking at a series of traction proof points um, to make our valuation analysis of the credibility, viability and suitability of the investment. Um, revenues are ideal, um, but they're not a lead indicator of the potential for outperforming success. Um, you've got to be able to show me more than the money initially. Um, there's got to be a clear strategic plan that can be well executed with the resources in place to support. Um, you know, on and around the revenues, um, you know, asking the question, are they sustainable, are they viable, and are they sticky, um, which is really key, because um, that will support the forecast annual recurring revenue as well. Um, so once you've retained, once you've acquired your customers, retaining them and getting the repeat business with you is really, really critical to that type, that, that, that approach. Um, and we look at lots of the customer metrics, such as customer, the acquisition costs, the lifetime value, their churn rates and their promoter scores as well, if they're actually sophisticated enough to be getting into that. So it's very much about what does the customer want? What is their need? Are they servicing that? And those indicators are really much telling them in terms of the fit and the purpose um, that, they're, uh, that, that they're striving for. Um, Michelle touched a little bit on the, the use of capital application, um, ensuring the, the prudency of that. It's really about the efficiency and effectiveness of the capital deployment in these really early stages. But optimising your burn rate with measurable, measurable impact, um, just not throwing money at anything and everything, you're just hoping it'll stick and you'll get some traction somewhere, but doing it with, with, um, with a decisive purpose and that purpose should match the business plan that you've got there as well. We talk about the roadmap to success being smart, uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-based. Um, again, so some good disciplines there to have uh, may really help us check and identify those um, those traction proof, proof points of where the business is likely to head um, and how they're going to navigate through that. Which leads into one of the other key, key parts is um, the experience and background of the founders, um, their individual character, um, you know, how they apply and approach problems and how they deal with difficult situations. So founder resilience and adaptability, which is a really hard metric to assess, uh, it's very much based on um, the, psych the, 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 the individual traits and, and psychology of the individual. Um, but it's so key as being a startup founder, because as we found, um, when the times get really, really difficult and tough, you need someone who's really got the EQ, RQ, as well as the IQ to power through these particular stages. Um, so the, I, the EQ being the emotional intelligence, the RQ being the relationship intelligence, and the IQ, as we know, has been being uh, the um, intellectual quotient that you've got to, um, to, to, to 
construct and apply and deploy. And that's really, really key for ultimately the business ongoing success and the ability to achieve, uh, achieve a pivot in a, in a very meaningful and directed way. Um, so a little bit about the, the pivoting aspects and sort of taking on board a few bit of what people have said. So, so pivoting is all about having a clear understanding of the organisation's core value proposition, really what you're about, um, uh, what your purpose is, how you're supporting um, the client. Um, what is your value to the market, the stakeholders and the ecosystem overall? If you've really got a solid grasp of that, you really know what you're about. Um, and that also to you about not only where your strengths are, but your weaknesses. Um, you need, to, you need to not only understand what the drivers of value are um, and how this value is created and transferred, um, but also the means, the methods through which business assets and resources can be redeployed. Um, so it's a, a, lo a, a long way of basically saying, we've got all these things that we do, we've got all these resources being um, capital, um, capability, IP, um, our, our, our clientele, um, our physical assets as well. We do this with them now, what else could we do with them in another way to help us either create more value or transition our value set? So pivoting is also about having the ability to work closely with clients on understanding how, um, on, on, on the understanding of how needs and requirements have changed and actually how you can service those particular su su support components as well. And there's been a bit of touching on that that Michelle provided as well as uh, and Nathan as well, stepping back and looking at the bigger picture and saying, what are the problems we're really solving? Are they relevant? Are they relevant to our customers? And what are the pain points that we can address to resolve those as well? Um, Know your core capabilities, how your skills, your knowledge, your IP can deploy, be deployed differently um, with a strong value proposition attached to that as well. That's really key to ensuring that you're able and capable to actually pivot. Um, so the summary around that is really ventures need to understand their business drivers, where they fit within the value chain, how value is delivered, the sources of value creation and the ways in which their methods and means of value adding can be, re can be redeployed. So I just got a couple of examples on that. Um, and I said Nathan gave some good one about the how on the API front and Angela gave a great example of how they look for new markets, um, you know, moving from the Australian focus into the international focus and bringing all that capability together. Um, so I've got a couple, if you, just, if you just go to the next slide for me, please. Leo, yeah, sorry, that's a slide that you can see up there at the moment. So this is the current portfolio um, within Cradle. Um, and I reached out to a couple of um, a couple of the, the teams in there and just asked them to give a bit more a bit more detail um, in and around their their um, their pivots and what they did specifically. Um, it was interesting that um, with with Birdie, that's a platform disguise, so it's a drone a drone company. Uh, it links um, market uh, providers, so the drone pilots and their capability uh, with clients who actually need drone services to uh, assess, evaluate, um, capture rich and deep data and imagery, and then the platform actually allows the ability to analyse, process. Um, and derive, derive value out of that as well. Um, Birdie was um, working one of their key clients and um, traditionally they'd used a lot of fixed wing aerial um, planes to um, do site assessments. But because of COVID, they've been able to, unable to, um, to do that. Um, so what they're able to do is, is use the, the capability of, um, of Birdie um, and their distributed network to capture all the sites within a couple of days uh, with modified safety for on-site procedures, for pilots. Um, and, the, and the outcome was a 1700 um, stockpile volume captured. So this was, this was um, in, in relation to um, the, the um, physical de depository site. Um, and they were able to report on that. And they were, they were able to do it in under three, um, Three, a three week turnaround, um, which was a significant time reduction saving and it involved around 50 pilots and 75 odd stakeholders um, within the client there as well. But it actually showed how the technology could be rolled out really efficiently. So that was a pivot, that was, that was um, Birdie helping their client pivot in a really meaningful way. And so uh, what we've seen in this environment is that people are, uh, are looking through a different lens, um, which is really providing and creating a lot of value from that side as well. 
Uh, one of the other companies, Stropro, which is a platform for um, structured products, um, uh, the focus there moved uh, away from trying to sell the product set to actually providing better capability around the porting, which, reporting and management, which was a real need because there's about a $4 billion um, structured product market out there that, that is basically going unreported in its entirety. Um, and that was also going to provide the capability by bringing um, individuals who didn't have an existing relationship with Stropro by allowing them to come on um, and have their investments reported, they are then able to capture those particular clients um, with li li little um, little economic outlay. Um, Revel, which is a, is a camera business with built-in um, AI um, for um, doing some pretty um, intense um, um, high extreme sports like skydiving. Um, initially, they were selling their product as a camera um, with the integrated AI technology as an app. And they've pivoted, so they're actually um, creating a, a, um, an extended service where it's actually tying in um, to um, a contract base. Um, so what they're doing is um, actually selling uh, a service to uh, skydiving um, ventures and uh, providing the end-to-end -end servicing around that as well. Um, so rather than relying on individual sales, they're actually locking up an extended large contract with, with um, um, annual carrying revenues, and they're actually getting fees out of each um, out of each event from that side as well, um, which is really helping the economics around there. A couple of things I've heard around as well, which is really interesting, and, and it's all about the resilience. As I've said, um, if you think of in, in, we are a pretty resilient species, and if you um, think about how, um, like restaurateurs, like how they actually manage and what have they been able to do, it's really difficult. Besides actually doing takeaway meals um, so i've heard of a couple of um you know um, chefs who've pivoted in such a way that they're doing delivering online cooking classes to corporates um really really innovative and 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 and, and valuable um and get, keeping the revenues moving and turning on um, the one i like and i think everybody's heard about it is um the pivot from the microbreweries um we've all got into hand sanitizer um and so you've got these um uh, these microbreweries um, like Young Henry's, which is a really well known one out of out of and in Sydney and Newtown, and all their vats are basically um, processing um, hand sanitizer now um, and not beer. Um, so we just got to hope that they're cleaning the vats out at the right time, otherwise it might not make the beer taste so good. Um, but again, uh, real innovation there in terms of how they've approached it. Um, worked with their staff um, and really enabled themselves to keep the lights on there as well. Um, and then another one, um, Hive BI, who are in a data analytics platform, um, they, they moved quickly under the COVID-19 environment to create a portal for LGAs, for local government areas. So there wasn't that reporting going on, so they saw a need to support and service um, their local government sector. Um, and they've been, so they had relationships there already um, with helping them with their logistics management side. Um, so they extended that and were able to um, use the capability around heat mapping, um, they created a public link and sourced data from various um, various um, platform sources, um, which was confirmed, which confirmed the cases by local government areas. So that was a real community benefit that was provided on that particular front as well. Um, yeah, so in key, it's you know it's really understanding what your core, your core skills, your core capabilities, um, what your aptitude and attitude is, um, whether you're prepared to um push forward through difficult times find value and meaning in uh in what you're doing for both you your staff your team and also your clients um, and towards that particular end find another avenue to success that you may actually um, unlock value that you hadn't realized um, that was presented there previously beautiful Th thanks a lot uh robert so maybe just uh quickly uh, one of the questions we got is um is your fund uh investing globally or just in australian startups robert so i missed that question uh is your fund focusing on australian startup only or are you open to other uh, countries Oh, no, we're open to opportunities outside Australian borders. Revel, Revel's in a US-based company, California-based company. Great. Maybe same similar question for you, Michelle. You want to unmute? Yeah, uh, from One Venture's point of view, most of our mandates are Australia. We do a bit in New Zealand. 
but we occasionally look at some companies where they have material business in Australia, um, but maybe an offshore company. So um, sometimes companies are actually domiciled somewhere else, but they end up building a business here. Even though what we're really looking for is companies we can take globally. It's just that our mandates are around, you know, expanding local entrepreneurial businesses more than, you know, bringing um, or investing in offshore businesses. But we do, we have done some and we do occasionally look at it in certain, certain areas. Okay. Um, beautiful. So, I mean, we, we're getting very close to, uh, to the end. So maybe I'll give an opportunity to, um, to uh, Nathan uh, and, and Angela, uh, you know, maybe around some of the tips uh, Robert and, and Michelle uh, gave. Is there, you know, anything you will, uh, you will take away in their kind of advice uh, to in pivoting, in mastering the art of pivoting? Nathan, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the biggest thing in the art of pivoting is, is you pivot based on what your customers are asking for. Because I think as everyone's kind of alluded to, right, is it's you think you know exactly what a customer's problem is, but when you actually start understanding your customer's needs better than they understand themselves, you realize that the problem you think they're, they're the problem they're telling you isn't the actual problem. It's something entirely different. So, um, you know, the whatever you build, whether te whatever tech stack you use, whatever you're, you're focusing on building, don't be afraid to pivot. Don't be afraid to, of change. Um, be very loosely, um, you know, when you build things, make sure they're easily combustible because that what that does, it makes it really easy for you to change your business model or move things in a different direction rather than be super hard coded and sort of thinking only one way. Um, and that's probably the biggest piece of advice. And it's probably one of the biggest learning lessons I've had in the last couple of months is don't be set on one thing. Don't focus purely on one thing. You got you to gotta really listen to your customers and really understand their needs more so. Um, and they know themselves and be, be prepared to, to change a million times um, since then. Not big things, but just little things that make a big difference. Beautiful. Angela? My mantra always is to learn. So fail to learn. But at the same time, having fun, have fun learning. I think people kind of get the, forget about the fun stuff that comes out of it. So learn, fail to learn, do things, um, you know, experiment and just, um, yeah, understand your customers as well. So I think that's the key thing that I want to tell people. Beautiful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, definitely, um, you know, definitely uh, a lot of learnings. I um, mean, similarly, you know, what I've, experience through um you know over the last uh, two months and a half now one of the key things i've been able um, to do uh, pretty much early early days was to literally call all our clients personally and you know see how they were doing and you know um as we were all shaping or thinking about you know how do we leave the office how do we keep the productivity up uh you know what do we do with the staff that is potentially uh impacted uh and i think that was um very valuable in terms of you know for us to um change our way of working but being really customer centric uh and uh yeah i'm, I'm pretty sure you know you built a uh, long-lasting relationship through difficult times um and you know as as uh, you know robert and michelle you said you need to also keep a cold head and look forward because you know in in there is always uh, great opportunities coming out of um um, yeah, a crisis. You know, one of them was actually for all of us to uh, to connect uh, virtually, um, and uh, you know, hopefully a lot of you uh, you know learned and uh, will um, have met uh, you know the the five of you and through the community uh, give a chance to promote their startup, uh, learn from other uh, entrepreneurs, uh, meet mentors and investors. So uh, thanks a lot for having been with us. Um, we'll have a private session now with Robert, uh, with uh, around 10 uh, entrepreneurs, uh, some of you uh, as part of this um, uh, live event. Uh, so big, big thanks to, uh, to all of you, all our, all our speakers uh, and, and partners. Um, looking forward to uh, continuing the, the journey. A big thanks here uh, to OVH Cloud. Uh, Ian Link uh, just posted uh, Yan Ling is um, the startup program uh, manager, uh, pretty active and, you know, always happy to help. 
um, and we'll be uh, kind of reaching out in a kind of a thank you email with uh, you know more uh, information and opportunities to uh, to be involved in future events. So thank you uh, everyone, and um, let's uh, let's crack a, a beer or wine uh, in the next session uh, with Robert. Uh, and for those of those of you in uh, in Europe, uh, you know, have a beautiful day. And uh, for all of us in uh, in Australia, great evening. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, Nathan, and Gerard for your time. And Robert, let's uh, give you a bit of time to uh, to to get a drink and uh, and see you on the, on the other side. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.